Welcome to the Lean Blog Podcast. Visit our website at www.leanblog.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Graben. Well, I want to welcome back to the Lean Blog Podcast, uh, Matthew May, the author most recently of the book In Pursuit of Elegance. I want to thank you for coming back. Thank you, sir. So this is a follow-on to our first discussion that hopefully people will go back and find. But I wanted to delve into a couple of the examples um, from your book. I like the way you weaved you know, examples, different um, cases of elegance together in a way that really made you think. And you know, uh, it's the only book I've read that I think that uses examples from The Sopranos, which is a show I, I've, I haven't watched a minute of, but uh, can appreciate the, uh, the story that you tell um, because of the news attention it got. And then the second thing you wrote about which, which I dearly love and I miss greatly from my days in Phoenix is uh, the In-N-Out chain. To anybody who's never had In-N-Out, how could you, you know, how, how, how could I really miss uh, a fast food chain? Um, it's interesting the way you weave this together. I was wondering if you could talk about those examples a little bit. Okay, well, um, you don't have to be a, a viewer of The Sopranos to know that the last episode is sort of what made the entire series. Um, the last episode, and the, and the series was an HBO series, ran for about eight years, and The Sopranos was a family name um, of Tony Soprano, who was a mob guy in northern New Jersey and um, organized crime. And the big, the big buildup for the last episode was two years in the making, and David Chase, um, the creator of The Sopranos, was slated to write, direct, and craft the last episode, so there was sort of an extra heightened awareness around the last episode. But the burning question of the last episode was, will or will he not get whacked, Tony Soprano? Um, was he going to you know, suffer the, 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 the fate of a, of a mob guy? And so half the audience wanted him dead, half the audience um, didn't. Uh, you know, the media was lit up beforehand, even Peggy Noonan. Uh, who writes for the Wall Street Journal, right, had devoted an entire column to the last episode, saying this was an apocal event. Uh, the end of the series was was going to be, uh, uh, we're, we're going to be missing something in our lives because the Sopranos are going to be going away. Well, lo and behold, everyone's, you know, glued at, at the edge of their seat, waiting to see what happens in the final seconds. Um, they're sitting in a diner. The entire family is there. All these unsavory characters walking around. Oh, my gosh. Is he going to get it now? Is he not? And all of a sudden, everyone's s- television screen went completely black, blacked out. And everyone in the world had the same reaction. Oh, my God. My cable went out. How could that possibly be? Took everyone by surprise. No one saw it as the ending that David Chase intended until the, the credits rolled. And then, oh, my gosh. The media went crazy within 24 hours, some crying foul, you know, uh, The Daily Show and, and The Colbert Report did, did spoofs of it. Um, and within 24 hours, Chase came out and said, everything that you need to know about the real ending to the story is in that episode. And all of a sudden, people went, because they, they showed it two or three times, and people had TiVo'd the, uh, the, the show. They went back and they watched it two, three, four times and came up with their own endings to the story. And so David Chase was able to subtract something that traditional wisdom says you never do, which is don't unresolve a story, leave it unresolved. Oh my gosh, how could you possibly do that? Yet he, he realized greater impact, far greater impact, triple the impact uh, than he ever could have with a uh, traditional story ending. So that's how I start the book. And it sort of sets up the notion of what isn't there can sometimes be more powerful and trump what is there. And that's the, the, the notion of the In-N-Out Burger. In-N-Out Burger, and you sort of have to live in the Southwest to appreciate In-N-Out Burger because at this point in time, that's the only place you can find it. Um, it's, a, it's a family institution here. We go pretty much every Sunday and having an In-N-Out Burger pretty much satiates you for the entire day. Um, but the thing about In-N-Out Burger, um, and In-N-Out Burger was the first burger chain to be a drive through um, They were the first to innovate the whole notion of moving away from the car hop that brings your, you know, you drive in and the, the car hop comes on roller blades and roller skates and delivers your burger and shake and fries to a drive through Well, they have only four items on, on their menu. Very, very simple items. Hamburger, cheeseburger, double-double, uh, and a drink. 
But unbeknownst to the neophyte, there is a very lengthy hidden or secret menu um, that is chain wide. Uh, the knowledge is shared somehow magically, so that when you go into uh, an In-N-Out burger and, and animal uh, and order an animal style or protein style or a Flying Dutchman, um, every chain knows exactly what it is, made the same way, and it appears on your receipt. Unlike when you go to Starbucks, where you you know you order your uh, tall, no whip, uh, half calf, double shot, extra hot, five pump. Uh, mocha, it just says tall mocha on it. Um, so the, the, what they have done is to resist expansion, which is another dimension of subtraction, if you think about it. They haven't expanded the menu formally. They've allowed their customers to do that, but they've kept it hidden and secret. And so there's a mystique uh, created, a certain seductive quality to going to an in and out burger. Yeah, it's it's like you're part of a club if you know... That menu. Do you think that's? I mean, the food is great, and this is lunchtime, so it's killing me to talk about In and Out right now. <laughs> and I'm jealous that you could go and get one today, and I can't here in Texas. But um, yeah, there's. I mean, the, the the food on its own is amazing. But then, I mean, how much do you think that sense of I'm part of something creates that bond that keeps you going back every Sunday? I think it's a good part of it because you're right. The the burgers are fresh. It's fresh beef, fresh lettuce. Uh, they they hand cut the fries. They hand slice the tomatoes. Their their slogan is quality you can taste, and it's true. And it's very simple. It's it's this, the standardization is unbelievable. No matter where you go, um, it is the same quality uh, food. Um, but yeah, you are a creator. You you they will do anything. You, just like Starbucks does with coffee, they'll pretty much do anything you want to a burger. But if there's enough call for it, it actually becomes standard, but becomes standard in a way that only the creators, if you will, know. And those that's, that decide to share it with others in the, in the clan, if you will, in the, in the group. Yeah, so I, I knew um, a double-double, you know, two burgers, two slices of cheese. One thing I, I learned from your book uh, is that you could actually order any combination of X by Y. That if you order a four by three, that's what, like four patties, three slices of cheese? Yes. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is, a couple of years ago, um, the, the CEO of Zappos.com went there and, and with, a, with a team of about six, and they, tri they ordered a um, 20 by 20. <laughs> Did they make it? And, and, and proceeded to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> now, there, there's a book out right now... Um, on the market about the in and out story, the family history, the story of the chain. And one thing I read in the review of the book said, you know, somebody in the company was developing a chicken sandwich and that the founder, owner, uh, CEO found out about it and killed the project and had a bit of a freak out. But that's not who we are. I guess that's menu subtraction by never by never going the whole McDonald's route of trying to offer everything. I think that's a huge part of it, you know, it, and it reminds me of last year when Apple was awarded most innovative computer company, I think, by Fortune. Um, and Steve Jobs said, you know, um, I'm proud of the things that we've done, but I'm even prouder of the things that we decided to not do. Thanks for listening. This has been the Lean Blog Podcast. For lean news and commentary updated daily, visit www.leanblog.org. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast, email mark at leanpodcast at gmail.com.